back in here. I uh, wanted to appreciate everybody taking time on a wonderful sunny day in Chicago uh, uh, to spend uh, from four to five with us. Please help yourself to some snacks and uh, lemonade in the back if you'd like. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity to have these monthly sessions for the Center for Community Health Equity to bring individuals uh, very involved in um, uh, addressing issues about uh, commu uh, community health disparities to talk with us about their experiences. Um, and we really appreciate all of you taking time to be here today. So my name again is uh, Raj Shah. I'm a, uh, one of the co-directors of the Center for Community Health Equity here at Rush. And Fernando Pimeo is the other uh, co-director from DePaul. Uh, and today we're very happy to have uh, Dr. David Ansel here to speak with us about his experiences around um, structural uh, violence and uh, uh, the reasons that that uh, affects how we do over our lifetime. Uh, David's been a prominent figure for many years and, um, in social justice and uh, health equity uh, in the Chicago region and uh, as the Senior Vice President and Associate Provost of Community Health Equity brings his unique viewpoints uh, for multiple institutions that he served at over time in Chicago. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to David. Thank you. Thanks, Raj. Only clap at the end of a talk because that might be falsely encouraging somebody, and I don't need any more encouragement. And uh, you know, I, I like to say, uh, with that introduction, my father would have loved it, and my mother would have believed it. I'm going to talk about uh, how inequality kills, but I'm actually going to mostly talk about like people along the way and what I learned in the process of trying to do this work. I have no disclosures, but I'd like to say everything I learned, I learned at Cook County Hospital. So I've not learned anything since. Um, so I'm gonna talk about so how did I become a human rights activist. So one of the ways I describe myself, I'm a doctor, I'm an administrator, but I actually, my uh, real purpose is uh, social justice and human rights work. And part of the reason I say that is, you know, what we do is important, but why we do it is even more important. And then, how, what does it mean in terms of how we present ourselves to our world we're in? Uh, so if I was a magician on the weekend, you know, and I just did tricks for kids, I would, wouldn't sort of name myself as a magician. Uh, even though that might be one of my talents. But I, I actually name up front that I'm a, a human justice, uh, 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 human rights activist, because health and health equity is an inherently a human rights issue. Uh, and once you just sort of say it, then you have to live it. Yes. I'm gonna, part two, so I'm gonna say how I got there. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about four people who've really influenced me. In, re in some in recent and some in past times, uh, they'll pop up through this talk because I think we're all influenced by others who showed us the path. And then the end is going to end and say, "What can you do? What should we all be doing?" So hopefully that'll occur. So uh, that's me. My uh, parents were immigrants to this country. My mother's family was wiped out in uh, the Holocaust. And growing up in that era in this country, one being an immigrant, but growing up with that as a past, and not as a child being able to understand it, and then opening the newspaper and seeing, you know, uh, Bull Connor hosing people in Birmingham and uh, trying to understand, that, hey, that kind of looks like Nazism to me. As a young kid, as a young, as a child, I realized that this isn't a really safe world. And okay, now what are you going to do about it? So that was sort of my my background. Uh, and you can see I'm carrying a, a baseball mitt there, but I was a terrible baseball player. So I, I figured I had to pursue something else. Um, my mother is still alive. She is the most wonderful human being you could ever meet. Really, she's so sweet, I, and I talk to her every day. Uh, that led me to medical school, which I instantly hated. <laughs> And I instantly hated medical school because I thought somehow, you know, I could just do good. And that's, you know, being a doctor was just pure good. 
And when I walked into medical school the first day, they handed me a stethoscope from Eli Lilly. Uh, and you know, you realize you're being indoctrinated into a fraternity of sorts. And there was all this built-in inequity that was really obvious. You know, sexism and racism, and I was really taken aback, and I was so shocked that I decided to quit medical school uh, and become a forest ranger. <laughs> For sure, I was in Syracuse, New York. There was a forestry school. I was a tree hugger, and uh, I decided that I was I was just going to be a forest ranger. But a, I met a group of people. These are some of them. Uh, he was valedictorian in my class. <laughs> uh, you know, it was a doggy dog medical school. But I, I, what happened is. We, a group of us just met and we got together and started studying the U.S. healthcare system and realized, oh my God, it's totally screwed up. And uh, that realization, at that moment in time, I became clear on sort of my reason for being a doctor was health was a human right. And if you believe that health was a human right, uh, and you wanted to live it out, uh, in those days, there was only one place in our mind to go, and that was Cook County Hospital. But we were inspired by this guy, Verkow, who uh, was a pathologist in the mid-1800s, a very famous guy, but he, uh, he investigated an outbreak of typhus in Silesia, and he said the reason for the outbreak of typhus was the lack of democracy in this region of Germany. And he became known as the father of social medicine, that social conditions caused ill health, which was something that in the 1970s we were observing. And so we were inspired that there was a historical relation to it. Actually, someone named Frederick Engels, who helped form Marxism in this country, uh, called the death of workers in Germany uh, murder. You know, that workers who died as a result of working conditions, that that was a form of state murder, uh, in a sense. So we were inspired by that. And, you know, this is what Furkow, one of the things, many things Furkow uh, said, uh, the physicians are the natural attorneys of the poor, and social fo problems fall to a large extent to their jurisdiction. So, I you know, this idea that there was something called social medicine, or the social conditions cause health, or social epidemiology, which I became, just sort of grabbed us in medical school. And we all decided we were going to come to Cook County Hospital to train, not because we were necessarily going to get the best training available in the country. Uh, we thought we would learn medicine okay, but we went there to save the hospital. We saw that part of the reason to go to Chicago and Cook County come here was to because healthcare is a human right. If, uh, if you're a lawyer and a, if you're gonna battle for um, you know, health equity, if you're gonna be a warrior for social justice and health is a human right, then you had to go somewhere and fight it out. And we, so we all just decided to go to Cook County Hospital, put one place in our match list as fourth year medical students. Our professors were all upset with us that we did this, you know, largely because Two years before, the doctors had gone out in the largest, in the longest doctor strike in U.S. history. Uh, Cook County Hospital still is. The doctors went on strike, and look what they're on strike for. Uh, health uh, is a human right. This guy, Jack Rabo, who is a uh, former seminarian, uh, was thrown in Cook County Jail. They won the strike, thrown in Cook County Jail with seven other people. Uh, it turns out that in Cook County Jail, it was Thanksgiving, the doctors didn't show up. They let him out of his cell to see patients. And he was seeing patients, and uh, by mistake, he walked out of Cook County Jail. <laughs> and it was Thanksgiving, he lived right down the street, so he's gonna hitchhike on California Avenue and realize that escaping, he was in jail for a, a misdemeanor, to find a back to work order by a judge, but escaping Cook County Jail was a felony, and it wasn't a good idea, so he banged on the door to get back in Cook County Jail. Many years later, he became the medical director of Cook County Jail. Like I said about, he was the first medical director of the health services. I like to say about Jack, he knew the place inside and out. <laughs> but even more importantly, many, many years later, in the 1990s, they got a phone call from a doctor 
uh, at Cook County Jail on a weekend. He lives in Oak Park, like I do. And on the weekend, he said, you know, I'm seeing this patient brought in by the police, and he's been tortured. He's got burn marks all over his body, and he's got a black eyes and things like that. It was Andrew Wilson. The torturer was John Burge. He actually uh, wrote a letter. He called up the state's attorney uh, at the time. Actually, the Cook County president called him up and said, stay out of it. But he didn't stay out of it. And Burge ultimately went to federal prison. The city paid about $700 million in settlements. And people went to death row because of that. But I'm just saying is, you know, the idea that we have a life to live beyond, if he could have just been a doctor just doing his stuff, uh, he would have been a good man. But it wasn't enough to do that. He actually went on to do uh, some great things. In fact, in the law office, the people's law office that did the, uh, did the proceedings against Burge many, many years, they have one thing on the wall, the letter from Jack Raba to uh, the state's attorney writing that this guy's been tortured. You know, and, and actually being able to say those words. So he's a friend of mine. So, you know, County was, like I said, it was a career in social medicine. We were doctors by uh, day. We did demonstrations, you know, in the afternoons. I call us doctors within borders. But this was White Coats, Black Lives, 1979. That's almost 40 years ago. And this was us pushing patients over to Rush when they stopped paying us at County. Now, County was. You know, a good way to sort of decide on the world is, uh, and whether there's equity or not, is white on top and is black on bottom. It's a good lens to look at the world. And county was black on bottom. It was a hospital for black people. The conditions weren't very good. If you're very interested, you can look at this, uh, spend some time tonight, because this is on YouTube. Watch this documentary from the BBC. It's called I Call It Murder which are almost the same words as Engels called what was going on in England. And I'm not going to pay, play you a clip from it, but it's on YouTube. And it's exactly what Cook County was like in 1979. In the care, because it was black people, poor people, people of color, immigrants. Uh, it was shocking to us that you had this place right across the street, Rush. So we pushed all the patients over to Rush when we weren't getting paid. But watch that video and you can understand how we felt. Uh, I actually had the conversation with Larry Goodman one day about he was chief resident when we pushed the patients over. Now that's not a good thing to do, pushing patients over. He said, we thought you guys were absolutely crazy. And we said, but you don't understand how we felt and how what we felt about the patients. But this idea of two worlds, you know, has, has gripped me, I think, since that time. You know, being a white kid who came to that institution, I had to deal with, most people, when you walked in the door of Cook County, you said, okay, it's great experience, you see great pathology, you're gonna to learn to be a doctor. Or many people got cynical, and some people left. But if you stayed, you had to do something about it. And as a white man who's been really lucky my whole life, I never, until I got there, I couldn't even begin to understand what it was like to live the lives uh, that were being lived. And I had the, had the privilege through my patients to learn this. So this is when Dora, and this is when Dora, about the time when I met her, uh, my patient, just down the street in Fantas Clinic, fourth floor, hot, no air conditioning, and I met Wendora. And she, like many uh, uh, patients, had high blood pressure and diabetes. And, and she and I became friends. I got to know many of her sisters uh, became uh, my patients. Her children became my patients. Her grandchildren are my patients. But what I had I've been to her house, I began to see how, you know, it wasn't just her beliefs in her behaviors, in her biology, that was determining her disease. It was that those, I don't want to minimize the importance of those things, it was actually where she lived. I'm living in Lakeview and she's living in Humboldt Park. We're literally two and a half miles away and we could be living different lives. And it's through her life and her tra travails uh, that I 
began to get a window into something that's terribly, horrifically wrong. Uh, and we're not really acknowledging it. We're not saying it. We're not doing enough about it. You know, her son died at 42. Granddaughter on Easter, on Easter got killed in the alley outside their house. She kept everyone inside. There's no grocery store. She said, we take all we had were candy, candy stores. And all they could get for the kids were starches. And they petitioned the alderman for a, a grocery store, but then she couldn't afford the groceries. You know, uh, Chris Rock calls Whole Foods the new Jim Crow because the $7 apples uh, in pairs, you know, that the access to fresh food has been put out of reach. And uh, the worst thing that could ever happen to her, she thought, was if she had a stroke and couldn't speak. And that's exactly what happened to her. She had a stroke and there was nothing we could do about it. You know, it's almost the runaway train is her neighborhood. And the neighborhood didn't just happen. You know, there's a study that just came out today from Northwestern about blood pressure control for, I think it was black men, I may be wrong, who actually live in concentrated uh, segregation versus not. And, you know, just move, being out of a neighborhood is better for your health. So, when Dora is with me all the time, uh, you know, and her sisters and the travails they've had, uh, their whole family is just, as a doctor, you say, how do I actually begin to go about doing this? And it's not just about medicine, it's not prescribing more medicine. So this we use, Raj uh, Shah uh, uh, has been really uh, helpful in helping Rush uh, think through, and I see uh, uh, Beth Lynch here, helping Rush leadership see the problems that we've uh, been part of you know, Russia's been here 173 years. We've been in the city longer than the city's been in the city. And so we've been on the west side for, uh, for over 100 years. And so we have an obligation to what happens in our neighborhoods. And this is the loop in life expectancy. How long you live is 85. If this was a country ranked number one in the world in life expectancy, think Japan. But you go three stops past Rush to Garfield Park, Pulaski. I drive across the west side every day. When you hit Pulaski, the life expecting plum is below 69. Think Iraq, think Bangladesh. You know, and this is literally juxtaposed against each other. And it's not like it just rained on the west side, right? It wasn't, do we have a bad rainstorm? You know, what happened on the west side? These are acts, actions, deliberate actions that have, and we can go, you know, there's a great article if you want to read it, Tanisha Coates, The Case for Reparations in the Atlantic, which explains redlining, the concentration of poverty uh, in these neighborhoods, and then the exploitation of wealth. You know, you don't get this mountain of wealth at the lakefront in a valley of poverty here without someone taking the wealth, right? I mean, there's, these are active processes. They're not just, oh, I woke up one day and those are just poor people and look at how they're behaving. So just, that's the, we took this to the board and we said, and it kept getting written, written out of the reports and then we kept writing it back in, that one of the reasons for this, so social determinants of health, sounds kind of passive, structural determinants of health, we said, such as structural racism. Uh, and our board passed two documents that said structural racism. And I'm using these words more and more and more in front of our leadership here. How does structural racism work here? And not to say there's not sexism and there's sort of capitalism and there's militarism and there's lots of isms. But you have to understand why things are the way they are in our city, in our country. You have to look through the lens of racism. So just, to, you know, when you look at inequality and why inequality kills, this is a giant uh, piece of it, is that inequ uh, inequality in income. So this is what income has done in this country. So this is not just a problem of the west side of Chicago. This is actually an international problem, that the rich have gotten richer at a faster rate than the middle class or the poor. 
you can see here there's been hardly, hardly any real growth in income except if you're in the top uh, you know, 1% uh, of uh, income uh, makers. By the way, who Trump wants to give $800 billion to off of uh, Medicaid and, and health care. That's essentially the Republican health care law. And in this country, what's happened is an increasing gap. So this is turn 50 in 1980, and this is by income quintiles. So these are the richest and these are the poorest. There was a gap in life expectancy always along a social gradient. But you can see what's happened to that gap. It's because as things become more amenable to treatment and things, and as we keep poor people from accessing these things, death gaps grow. I can tell you it doesn't look like this in Canada. It doesn't look like this in, in Canada. Uh, so here's, here's a wonderful new news. And it's not wonderful new news, it's actually bad new news. And here's the bad new news. So this is reported, I'm going to go over this with you because it's a little confusing. But this is uh, what's happened to white people in America since the turn of the century, meaning not uh, turn of the last this century since about 2000. So what's happening to white people in this country without college degrees is that their life expectancy is dropping. That's white women. And uh, it, this is all white men is going up, but white men without a college degree, life expectancy has gone down. Because there are so many white people in this country, this is a giant deal. At first it started in Appalachia, like Kentucky, and, and those areas. Now it's across the whole country. Uh, there are so many people, white women are dying at a, at a more extreme rate. There are so many people who died. It's bigger than the AIDS epidemic deaths in the 1990s. And because of that, life expectancy for the US as a whole dropped. That's not happened in any country in the world except Russia after the fall of the Soviet Union. So put that in context. And these uh, economists who discovered this, you know, from Princeton, call them diseases of despair. And, uh, and they say it's because of a lifetime of cumulative disadvantage. Now the diseases are cirrhosis of the liver, drug overdoses, but actually the number one and two reasons why people are dying is because heart disease mortality hasn't moved very much and cancer mortality hasn't moved, which are the two biggest causes of death. Oh, by the way, on the west side of Chicago, two biggest causes of death, it's not gunshots, it's heart disease and it's cancer. Now I'll tell you, when uh, for 500 years of life in America for black people, no one called them diseases of despair or diseases of cumulative disadvantage. Uh, when you think of violence on the west side, and uh, violence in Chicago, violence in general, I'm not condoning it, it's very, very bad. But there's 30,000 deaths in this country a year from uh, gunshot wounds. 20,000 are, 20, are suicides and 10,000 are murders. There are about 60,000, not quite 60,000 deaths from drug overdoses that's driving some of this in the white population. And of course, when that's been happening, you have white congressmen calling for the police to carry Narcan, which is the agent that you know uh, revives you when you've had a narcotic overdose, and we should have drug treatment programs. I can guarantee you in the 1970s on the west side, we got the war on drugs and we got mass incarceration. So, the, but the, the thing is, is attention to diseases of despair driven by income inequality and uh, disadvantage over a lifetime is exactly the same problem that we're having on the west side of Chicago. If it gets attention and we do the right things like healthcare and treatment and mental health, you know, that's good for everyone. But this is actually relatively uh, new, uh, new news and it's actually shows you that if people don't have jobs, if they don't have education, if they don't have hope, family life falls apart, people die early, prematurely. So this just came out last week from the University of Washington. Life expectancy from county to county uh, varies by 20 years. And guess what state's the worst? Kentucky. Actually, the former slave states are the worst almost for white people and uh, black people. 
uh, former Confederate states. And the, the highest life expectancy gap is about 35 years when you get from the one area to the next, and it's literally you can drive a half day and lose 35 years of life expectancy. And that's our great country of America. All right, this is where I get into structural racism, structural violence. So what do I mean by structural racism, structural violence? So structural violence and structural racism is the policies and procedures, the rules, the way in which we've organized our society uh, that are embedded in the rules that keep people from actually rising up uh, on their own um, on their own means. Uh, so that's structural. So if you look at uh, redlining, for example, uh, FHA mortgages, if you look at mass incarceration, if you look at the, uh, the uh, exploitation of uh, neighborhoods, removing jobs out, act, active uh, acts, if you think about tax policy that takes money and programs from poor people and gives them to the rich, those are structural. Public health policies, you know, public health infrastructure, school nurses, you know, you name it, uh, those are structural. And it's a form of violence because people are hurt by it and people die as a result of it. So when I think of causes of disease, we think of things like bacteria and we think of you know eating and smoking, but I posit that structural violence and particularly structural racism in the United States is a leading cause of premature death. And we got to call it out for what it is, because otherwise we're fixing, if the problem's in the individual, let's fix the individual. That's not saying we all got to, don't have to eat right and stuff, but if the problem is there's not food availability, and if food is not available and cheap, then we got to address that as a health problem uh, and deal with the fact that those structural types of things. So I, structural racism is America's disease. And so I'm going to just quickly, without belaboring it, but it could all be belabored, is six ways that structural racism kills. Concentrated a black disadvantage. So one of the things with white poverty in the United States, so in Chicago, for example, there are plenty of poor white people. There's not one poor white neighborhood. So if you're a poor white kid, you're more likely to grow up in a neighborhood with middle class and maybe some wealthy white kids. Uh, but black poverty is concentrated. Now let me just say, as we always focus on black poverty, black uh, disadvantage. But let me just tell you, that did not happen without the concentration of white advantage in this country. So if you look at the development of suburbs, and you move to the Kenilworth, and Kenilworth has zoning laws. Those zoning laws don't allow poor people to come in. There's no low-income housing. So if you're black and poor, you can never get into Kenilworth. And so we always look at, oh my gosh, the west side, it must have rained on the west side, but look what happened in Kenilworth and what happened in you know, Deerfield and uh, Hinsdale and all these other places. These are public policies that have created these neighborhoods. And it's, but it's different for white people because they get distributed more, more widely. And then they have the, the children have the advantage of the schools and, and the facilities. Structural racism in the way that we, are, we do things. Uh, police, incarceration, schools, hospitals, housing, jobs, food. It turns out, if you look for any disease in America, uh, entity for which you can die, if you go to a hospital that serves predominantly black people, the quality's worse. And hospitals that serve, I think Medicare measures this. They have a five-star scale. Rush is a four-star hospital four-star health system, so is Oak Park, so is Copley. So four-star means higher quality, lower mortality. They've looked at all the four and five-star hospitals in America, mostly serve white people. Now if you're a black person who goes there, you're gonna get nice care. But most, but the hospitals that mostly serve black people, they're uh, one and two-star hospitals. Now I'll tell you, I spent uh, 27 years at Cook County and Mount Sinai, I call it one street, two worlds literally Ogden Avenue, 0.8 of a mile. And a white person would come to Mount Sinai if their car crashed in front of Mount Sinai. But it's not because of the color of the skin of the people. It's due to the structure and the way that we finance health care. So Mount Sinai, Cook County, take care of uninsured people, higher uninsured rates than brown and black people. When they get insurance, it's more likely Medicaid. 
then you can't buy the machines, you can't hire the doctors, and that's how structural racism works. We have an apartheid healthcare system. Okay, embodiment of racism. This has two ways. We think about, so racism gets embodied, and people like who have perceived racism, they have things happen to them, they embody it, it affects them biologically, and it creates harm. So that's one way that racism gets embodied. There's a whole literature on stress and all the all of the impacts on that, different hormone things. Women are follow people who say I've been followed around in a store, or the police have stopped me, or do things perceive racism, have lower birth weight babies. It's not only uh, embodied, it's transmitted generationally. But there's another way that in racism gets bodied in terms of mistrust, historical mistrust. Not only things have been bad done to me, but they were done to my parents and this and that, and we as a community, we don't trust it. But the flip side of that is the embodiment of privilege, which we don't talk about as much. Just like concentrated black neighborhoods of disadvantage we think about, but we don't think about the white neighborhoods of advantage that led to that. We don't think about the embodiment of privilege. Listen, I worked, I had to go to medical school, that was hard, I had to study, I had to work hard and things like that. But, and I'm looking at, I'm an uphill path. But compared to others, I don't. And unless I sort of can put myself in the shoes of another person, I can't even come close to understanding what it's been like. And so the embodiment of privilege is something that, you know, I need to own, and I think the other white people in this room have to own as well, because it doesn't feel like you're embodying some kind of advantage, but it's relative to what other people go through. So then there's bias, implicit and uh, explicit, the way our brains work. And so I may look at you and, you know, think things unconsciously. We don't mean to, but it affects my behavior and it can affect the trust and mistrust. Then there's inequality and the quality of healthcare delivery. There's just people get different things. And it's been shown over and over again. And maybe the part of the reason why the opioid epidemic is affecting white people is because doctors prescribe less medication for pain for black and brown people. So it may be saved black people's lives that they're not being, you know, overdosed by doctors. But it's, it's not a good way to be uh, to, to, to doing things. And then there's inequity in health outcomes. So there's, in many ways, it layers out. So when I think about being at Mount Sinai, a doctor at a Cook County here, I'm like a different doctor. Mostly because here everything's within reach. Whether it's Sinai and County, you could know the best thing to do and never do it. I'll give you an example. In 27 years at Mount Sinai, in County of Sinai, zero patients got a transplant. Zero. And yet the organs that uh, provided for the people to get transplants at Rush and Northwestern UC came from the trauma units from black and brown people and uninsured people. That's just the fact of America. The chief medical officer at County once came over, Terry Mason, who's now the health department, County Health Department, said, David, come to my office and I'm chief medical officer. David, the wait list for the eye clinic is so long at county, you can go blind on the wait list. And it's literally across the street. And we're not outraged about it. We're not living the outrage that in this country we, we've allowed it to So I'm going to a few little things here. Once most of the violence against Negroes occurred in the countryside, that, that was before the Negro immigration of the 20s and 30s. Now there's not a great American city from New York to Cleveland or Detroit from Washington nation's capital, Chicago, that's not disgraced by the wanton killing of innocent Negroes. Once the classic method of lynching with the rope, now it's the policeman's bullet, the NAACP, 1951. <laughs> what we have now are cameras, video cameras. That's all. You know, and yet me, they stop me, how are you, how's the day, are you having a nice, you know what I mean? It's a very different experience. It's, a two, it's two different forms of America. So there's the LaFawn McDonald's autopsy report, 16 years old, Pulaski Avenue, the street with the lowest life expectancy, shot 16 times, mentally ill. You know, this is the city that closed down mental health clinics. Uh, and yet, uh, and, and uh, Tom Dart, the sheriff, said, you know, it was, you could, you know, the jail is the number one mental health facility in the state. And it's not, not like you can, you know, put fairy dust on people and they're going to get better. Um, of course, covered up. We don't tell the truth. We're not honest about it. 
if you count up in just black men between the age of 25 and 54 in the United States. So in general, men and women are about equal proportion. But because men tend to be a little bit screwballs, there's actually 100 women for, 90, uh, for 99 white men in the United States. So it's almost equal. But for, in, for the black population, for every 100 black women, there are 83 black men. And depending on where you live, that proportion can be as low as 60. So the, there's one city in the United States with a large black population that has a, a hundred black women and 60 black men. Does anyone want to guess which one that is? Ferguson. Okay, and why are they missing? 900,000 of these are prematurely dead and 600,000 of these 25 to 54 year old are in the criminal justice system. Now you remember Ferguson, had a uh, violated the 14th Amendment, the whole city violated the 14th Amendment to due process to the Constitution, structural violence, structural racism, both the premature deaths as well as the imprisonment. So I, when I give talks, I say it's chance for a young black kid on the south side of Chicago living the age of 65 is 50 percent. This is from an, uh, an uh, American Journal of Public Health article a few years ago. And I could go to audience and say, well, what's the reason people say violence? And I say, no, heart disease and cancer is accounting for over 60% of the premature mortality. Okay, Steve Whitman. So this is, you know, I didn't really understand all of this till I met Steve. And Steve is dead now, so we all have to carry on in his. But Steve was a social epidemiologist. He was, uh, he's a fantastic guy. But he, after college, went to teach in Birmingham, Alabama at Mills College, which was an all-black college. And he observed the lives of black people in Birmingham, Alabama, and it changed him. A white Jewish guy from New York, and it changed him forever. And he became a mathematician and then an epidemiologist, and he became a social epidemiologist. He looked at what social causes of disease and really about how did racism and poverty act here. So if we asked the question, how does structural racism work here? As a way to look at a phenomenon, it's, it's immensely helpful. Because when you ask that question, hiring, how does structural racism work here? Students, you know, stu bringing students, but even health outcomes. How, is, how does structural racism work here? And so Steve was very, very good at that. Here's Steve, you know, I showed you that chart of life expectancy that Raj and others uh, produce uh, for our board. We've been taking it out into the community and showing it to community residents on a listening tour of the West Side. And you know what? People get the numbers and can now talk about this. So we did this, we did a study on breast cancer mortality and we would go out and show the numbers on black and white women breast cancer mortality in Chicago and show it uh, to women. And women, when we explain the reason why there was this gap in mortality, why black women were dying at almost twice the rate as white women, the women cried. And they cried because prior to this, they thought the problem was inside them. And when we showed them, this was Steve, uh, this was from Chicago Magazine, uh, when we showed them the reason, uh, and they realized it wasn't just them, uh, they, they cried. And so I think showing data and using data in this way uh, is very, very helpful when you're trying to explain to people who may be reluctant to understand structural racism, because it's not personal. It's the way we design things. We could undesign it at the same time. But Steve, Steve was a great friend, a great teacher. In this room one day, I was on the county board. I got on Cook County Board's board. You know, when they, were, they fell off the cliff, they made an independent board. And I looked at Cook County quality data, and I began to show it here. And I compared Cook County Hospital's quality data compared to national standards. And it wasn't up to standard. Steve was in the room, and he yelled out, it's genocide. Rush is building this big tower, and people are dying in Cook County. And there was a doctor from Cook County here, really a fantastic doctor, and he said, but when the patients come to me, they get excellent care. 
And I was a little mad at Steve because I'm on the board and he's yelling out genocide. <laughs> and, yet, and then there's this doctor saying, yeah, but they get good care. And how do you reconcile those two things? And the fact is, if we have systematic process, processes that let, lead to the premature mortality of people over time in certain locations, well, Steve had a point. And the doctor had a point, yeah, when the patients get to me, but it's not necessary, but it's not good enough if we just say, I'm going to go to Cook County Hospital or Mount Sinai and be a hero uh, when we've allowed these systems <laughs> that actually kill people uh, to build up around us. That's Steve. I met Steve because back in the 70s, you watch I Call It Murder Tonight for your fun is better than scandal. Uh, there's a scene where they're bringing these patients who are uninsured into Cook County Hospital, one after the other. And they asked, the, the, if, if, because my parents were British, when this went on British television, the show was about uh, the BBC showing the Brits what healthcare in America was like. So when my relatives uh, saw, they were calling my mother, is David okay? Because they knew I was at Cook County. But the, uh, they brought these patients in, it was called patient dumping. People didn't have insurance. It turns out we uh, met Steve and we did a study and we published it and the law changed actually and the Emergency Medical Labor Act, Treatment Act is the only form of universal health care we have in this country, the right to emergency care. So we didn't know how to add two numbers together. So that's how I met Steve uh, Whitman. But Steve became famous also during the Chicago heat wave. You may remember the heat wave in Chicago, and there was an argument back and forth. All these people were dying, and Mayor Daley was saying, well, it's hot in summer, you know? It's uh, always hot in summer. And you can't call every death a heat-related death. And meanwhile, the medical examiner is saying, yeah, but the bodies are piling up in this heat wave. Well, Steve went and added up all the excess deaths. And rather than 300, it was 759 deaths. He was called into the mayor's uh, office. They locked the doors with the lawyers. And uh, they said to him, well, how do we, uh, how do you, you know, this can't be true because it made the mayor look terrible because it was predominantly isolated black people uh, uh, who, older people, and they blame people, few using city cooling centers, right? It's structural. There weren't the cooling centers near the people. No one was going out. Well, when they found it, it was 759 deaths. They said, how do you know that? Those are just numbers. And Steve said, I'm only a mathematician, <laughs> but you know, but he was very outspoken on, on structural issues and structural racism and was a big inspiration for me. He once added up all the excess black deaths in Chicago and it made the front page of, and this was just black people dying because they didn't have the same mortality rate as, you know, white guys in Chicago and no one's saying like the, your average Dabaris guy, you know, has the greatest health. Uh, uh, in, in life, but this 3,200 excess black deaths uh, in one year in Chicago made the front uh, page of the Sun-Times. Does that number remind anyone of some big national event? 9-11, World Trade Tower, right? Went to war, spent trillions of dollars, and yet this is the annual life experience of being black in Chicago and inequality. And, and we tolerate it. So this is some of our breast cancer stuff. We actually went around, this was the gap. Uh, when we put out that was this gap, we had some people in town said it's actually genetic. Black women get worse breast cancers, they're more estrogen receptor negative, and while many of those things are true, that doesn't lead to the cause. And we said yes, but then if it was genetic, why was it once equal? And now it's split, right? What is it, what is genetic changes just happened? And then we decided we would compare uh, Chicago, which is in blue, to the United States, which is red, to New York City, which is in green, and then you, we asked the question, what happens to black women's genes when they cross the Allegheny Mountains? You know, you, you could just, like, we're explaining this to scientists, believe me. So this is how scientific racism works. Experts say it's biological. Every disease is biological by its very nature, but it's not the cause. The cause is structural racism. So then we did the map of Chicago, and we said these are the high mortality communities. The African-American ones are in green, and these are the hospitals with accredited cancer programs. 
So what's wrong with these women? They moved in those neighborhoods, right? Structural racism as a cause of these. What we did, we just published this paper. We went around to every hospital and got them to share quality data, did quality improvement with them, and now the mortality gap has decreased in Chicago by 35%. And in no other large city in the United States with a large black population has the mortality dropped. So the fact is all we said is you're not providing good quality. If you provide better quality, women will get better care. And we publicize this every year. And it became part of the city's health report. But that's structural racism. Okay, Provident Hospital, when we were in there doing some quality stuff, this is where they were developing mammograms in 2010 in Chicago. So life expectancy in Hyde Park with that beautiful new U of C hospital, when you're coming down Cottage Grove there, and you look over and you see the beautiful hospital overlooking Washington Park. You literally walk a quarter of a mile across and you come to Provident Hospital, outpost of Cook County Hospital. You see where the developing mammogram, see what she has on her face? She's covering face, manhole, sewer, black women getting mammograms. Genocide, structural racism, what do you want to call it? That, you know, we just, one of our staff people discovered this. They, they've since fixed it. But the idea that that was tolerated, so this is what Steve said, it all has to do with racism. This was an interview uh, done before he died. Uh, race, in my opinion, of course, whose else opinion am I going to tell you? <laughs> Racism is the definition of the society we live in and the driving force in society. So everything around us, in my mind, is driven by racism. I mean, there are a lot of other things that matter in a huge amount, and racism isn't the only kind of oppression. There's oppression against women, sexism against gay people, and on and on. There's huge numbers of ways in which we oppress people, but the definition of the United States is racism, and as far as I'm concerned, the country was founded on racism and perpetuated by racism. So he was early on speaking this, uh, and I think it's incumbent upon us to talk about it with an artist. Otherwise, it's, not, it's never going to change. It's, historical injustices had occurred. We can't change the past. We can't forget the past. But if we allow historical injustices to move with us going forward, shame on us. So I told you I had to tell you, this is Sarah E. So Sarah E. Uh, was 25 when she got Wilson's disease of the liver. So a metabolic disease that affects the liver. It's cured by a transplant. I was chief medical officer here. I was working with this community to get access to transplants for the undocumented, for the uninsured. I told you 30% of the organs came from the uninsured. So they had a right to get organs if they were sick. This woman, young woman, was brought to Cook County Hospital. Our doctors from Rush saw her and said, you're undocumented, we can't give you a transplant. The, uh, they went on marches uh, and did hunger strikes in front of hospitals. And uh, ultimately, she died, not even getting an appointment at the Rush or Northwestern or anywhere else. It turned out that uh, once uh, the next summer, a college student sought me out from Bates College, a young Latina from Waukegan. Actually, she's applying to medical school now. She, uh, and she came, and I, want you, I said, I want you to work on this problem of transplantation that you undocumented. And uh, it turned out Sari was her first cousin. And I had her interview her mother. And her mother talked about calling up. She even got insurance, called up the hospital, Northwestern in this case, and being turned down with, what's your social security number? And this happened, this young woman died, and they did a strike with empty caskets. And so it's for these patients that I, I do this work. I'm animated, I'm a human rights activist. You know, I'm a doctor, but I'm a human rights activist. That's my first job. And it doesn't matter what job I get, I'm totally out there with doing this and need more people to do it. So there's the last guy, Quentin Young. Quentin died last year. And Quentin Young uh, was a doctor here in Chicago who really was an advocate uh, for human rights and uh, fair health care, he would get up every day and say, what have you done today against the forces of reaction? And he would ask that question. This is Quentin being arrested. Uh, he was the, one of the reasons I came to Chicago and really one of my heroes. So we're at a debate in this country, is health care a human right? 
And I, I like this is from the first time around. You see that no pubic option? <laughs> People got confused. Or don't steal from my Medicare to support my socialized medicine. I just filled out a Medicare card. It was the easiest thing in the world to fill out the Medicare insurance card. Guy came to me in the mail. My gosh, everyone should have it. It's so simple. Uh, and as our rush medical students and other medical students, you can't do this without public action. I'm just saying is you got sometimes you gotta lie down in front of City Hall or you gotta block traffic or you gotta do a march. And this is Rush Medical Student uh, for, after Laquan McDonald uh, uh, was the, was revealed, sit, lying down in front of City Hall. Here's the trauma center folks, young kids, fearlessly fearless leading by the youth, getting a trauma center on the south side when nobody wanted one. So you sometimes we need public action as well. And, Ultimately, we need a single-payer healthcare system. So now I get to the end. So I have a certain set of rules. Well, it's not easy getting up in the morning and putting your clothes on, coming into work, dealing with everything. But if you're going to be an activist for human rights, you know, you got to have a set of rules. So if not me, who's going to do it? And if not now, what? Uh, I always say no is a stepping stone on the way to yes. Because the first thing that someone says when you want a human right is no. When women came out in 1850, Susan B. Anthony said, we want the right to vote. No. Uh, when uh, those kids at Fisk College sat in on the, at the Woolworths or, uh, you know, Martin Luther King and Montgomery and Rosa Parks, the answer is always no. So you have to like, no is, you got to expect no's. You can't be defeated by no's. You have to be energized by the no's. Don't a ever ask for permission to do the right thing. And don't ask for permission if no is a possible answer, if it's the right thing to do. I always ask, what more can I do right now to bend the arc of the universe towards justice? Because it's not going to bend on its own. And my last one is going to be a bear, be a grizzly. You know, no use, no, no need for teddy bears here. That's just for bedtime. Healthcare is a human right, and what can you do about it? Take it personally. Take it personally. Uh, Personal actions, how we speak. White people need to speak about structural racism with each other and to the leaders of their organizations. It's not up to black people to do this. Uh, practice it, because the first time I tried to speak at Cook County Hospital, I was on a leaflet for a demonstration. The press called me and I'm going, ah, 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 boom. I didn't know how to speak. I didn't teach myself how to speak. Practice like everything else. Get in front uh, and speak. Uh, uh, ask the question, how does structural racism work here? You can ask the question about sexism. How does sexism work here? And if, it's, if the lens says white on top, white men on top, black and brown on the bottom, then it's working here. And what are we going to do? What are we going to do to reverse it now? Not next week. Uh, address the institutional inequities research. Uh, how do the decisions of the place that I work affect the lives of the poor? How do they affect the lives of the poor and feel uh, like you ask it? And, and nationally, we got to fight the Republicans. We got to get them out of office, and we need uh, you know single payer universal health care. I got to rush. I was so outraged. I wrote two books. <laughs> and the first one I wrote about what it was like to be a young white guy going to county back in the 1970s. And the second one that just came out two weeks ago is called The Death Gap, How Inequality Kills. It's meant to a general reader to understand why things are the way they are and what we can do about it. That's my grandson. <laughs> <laughs> and he is so smart. <laughs> and with that, I'm going to stop and take questions. So thank you very much. shock you into silence? <laughs> and we want to go demonstrate? Yes? I, I actually don't, don't have a question, but I, I have a comment. I grew up on the west side of Chicago, so I, I lived through a lot of the things that, uh, that you talked about. And um, uh, I work at a, uh, a school. I, I'm from DePaul uh, University. Uh, I'm a, a doctoral student. Good for you. <laughs> Uh, and I work with the school here on the west side where the, uh, the, the student population is 
um, about 100% African American, and the teacher population is about 97%. Uh, and primarily that's because most of the teachers in uh, public schools in Chicago or across the country are white. But um, I guess I do have a question. How, how would you go about um, uh, talking to the school, I've kind of talked to them, you know, my dissertation topic is in the area of uh, culturally relevant pedagogy. And I've kind of talked to them about, you know, uh, the different curriculum and that sort of thing, but they're very resistant uh, in terms of, uh, you know, working with the curriculum to um, uh, strategize and focus it more towards uh, the, the population. So how would you approach uh, a talk to them? Yeah, I, I think, you know, the reason why, why I think we need a lens to look at the stuff is asking the question, how does it work here, is in a very non-personal way to sort of lay it out, you know, and then sort of say, how do we go about remedying it? The problem with, uh, the, problem with the embodiment of privilege is you don't see it. And there's different ways. There's different ways uh, to do this, and uh, I and I don't sort of know how it works. But there's uh, a couple of us saw Kamara Jones, Dr. Kamara Jones, who talks about structural racism in allegories and their stories. And I I suggest you go and look at her YouTube's on the internet. And one of them she tells is the Gardener's Tale, and what it is to have like uh, two sets of flowers growing in different soil. And where you have to think about the soil that the flowers grow in, but you have to think about who's the gardener. And the gardener prefers one flower over the rest. So when you're working in an environment like that and you're a white person, you don't, you think by showing up, you've discarded your privilege. And the fact is you haven't. So sometimes using an allegory in a story as an exercise and then discuss it. That's what she suggests. And the gardener tale is like, you know, four pages. So you can actually work it through as an exercise. Because I think what we want people to do is just to understand why having all 97% white teachers might not be adequate and there's gotta be other experiences uh, for these children. But that's, I don't know if that would work. Yeah, I'm gonna try it. Thank you. Yes. So um, but very often when we talk about black America, it's this umbrella term for African Americans and Africans in diaspora, when in rea reality there are significant differences. So um, when you, in, in your time in all three hospitals, White Sinai, Rush, and County, have you seen some of those differences? Yeah, I will tell you, this is what I, what I mostly focus on is that 25% of the black population that lives in concentrated disadvantage uh, in poverty. It used to be one-third. Uh, it turns out because of segregation in this country and historical segregation, much of the black population still lives in, in class segregation. Uh, it has negative health impacts, even that. But I do think there's differences, and I don't think we can talk in one broad brushstroke. Uh, but insofar, you know, it, what's happened in this country writ large is poverty has increased and child poverty has increased. So these are two big, and it's affected lots and lots of white people as well. So I think the larger issue here is about sort of how do we break down poverty? And that's sort of the active forces of exploitation have really taken jobs out of neighborhoods. Because people want to work, they just don't have the jobs, and the jobs don't pay money. And we have to create educational opportunity advantage for people uh, who are poor uh, in general. Uh, but we actually have, you know, like this article Tanisha Coates calls it case for reparations. You know, the reparations have to go forward. We have to, and that's tax policy. It's, it's things like how do we have universal education? Because we've looked at the different things, say Canada, you know this, and in the United States or Toronto with low birth weight babies. And there's, you don't see the same racial and uh, economic uh, gradient. Uh, and it's because they have a universal health care system, it's easier to go to school. So the repair to this is actually broad, broad brush societal repairs. And of course people have money and education do better across the United States 
uh, and if you make a certain amount of money, you live longer, no matter who you are. So I think that that's, I hope I answered the question. But, uh, but I, I think we need to focus on these areas because our whole mental image of it is people are doing this to themselves. And I think the, the mental construct is, oh no, we're, we've done this through our policies, therefore we can reverse it through our policies. Mm -hmm. It turns out that if you're a black middle class person, you're living on the south side and there was a trauma, you were as disadvantaged as you know, the person living in Englewood when it came to trauma, or you, your 911 call takes you to Roseland Hospital versus Rush or Northwestern, you're disadvantaged by that proximity uh, that's uh, structural and designed in. And, uh, you know, people just, you know, I'm not, no, you don't want me in your neighborhood, I'm going to live here. So I think there's all this layer of structure that actually can impact everyone's outcome. Beth? scientific racism, I think you raise a really good point. We have these wonderful scientists and they're doing wonderful science and it seems not to be biased, right? It, we're just studying things, but I actually think it's a form of structural racism. So I think we haven't done a great job of articulating that, uh, but I do think so uh, when one's looking for, you know, it, it's not biologically feasible that every bad disease in the world is sort of codes with melanin in the skin. It just can't be. But I think we allow that to get away and then, you know, the human genome project shows we're 99.6% alike and then we plunge the depths of that 0.4% to find the biological difference. Now that's not the same as saying there are particular, if there's some diseases that are biological and you could find the right target for it, but to look for them specifically by race and then saying as precision medicine is, is racist. So the example I can give you is a drug called Bidil. So Bidil is a drug, it's been known for many years that uh, there's different medications you can use for heart failure. And a very famous cardiologist did a study on these two drugs, and they put them together in a package. And they got the FDA to approve it for the treatment of heart failure in black people, because it was studied mostly in black people. Now, most drugs in this country are studied mostly in white people. Black people aren't participating in clinical trials, they don't have the opportunity. You know, it's the white people from the suburbs, wherever, that are in these trials. And yet, when the drug comes out, it's good for black people as well as brown people and white people, but in this one, which was studied in black people, wasn't good for white people. And the FDA approved it. Scientific racism, structural racism, done in the guise of science. And uh, there'll be more and more of this as we look for, you know, black breast cancer, black ovarian cancer, and others. Anyway, I want to be respectful to people's time. Thank you for coming and listen, listening to me pontificate. So thank you. Thank you.